we have uh, looked at the difference between private goods and public goods and we have also seen that the market typically uh, under provides public goods. We also looked at the Lindahl equilibrium as one way of trying to see how one can price uh, public goods. Um, but of course, we saw that there are practically there are difficulties in that. Today we will be talking about externalities and that is in a production function or a consumption function of any individual or company, if something else well which is not within their control comes into it and affects the production or the consumption utility. And so we will define what is an externality, try to see how to analyze it and see what are the ways in which we can incorporate it into the economic calculations. So a definition of an externality, you can look at any uh, textbook and you will find similar definitions. This definition is from Colstar. An externality exists when the consumption or production choices of one person or firm enters the utility of another entity without that entity's permission or compensation. So please remember the critical point is that if some variable enters the consumption or production choices without the permission or compensation. So in case two companies have an agreement and uh, there is a transfer of an output of one company to the other company that would not be considered an externality. But when something comes in which is not within the control of the company and without the permission of that company then it becomes an externality. So let us look at um, from in the public domain there are a number of cartoons which illustrate uh, negative and positive externalities. <laughs> this cartoon um, is from The Economist uh, and it is about shale gas and as you know uh, in the oil sector uh, the sh shale gas had the potential to transform the oil sector and it has actually resulted in some countries for instance the US which was a net oil importer has now become uh, an oil exporter. And uh, the, this cartoon shows there is in Greek history there is this uh, concept of there were these uh, sirens who, who were an uh, attractive set of um, who with their singing would attract ships and these ships would get then um, uh, stranded and destroyed in these rocks and this was this is there in the legend. So in a similar fashion this cartoon basically shows that when you are trying to get shale, um, shale gas the difficulty is the environmental impacts of fracking and fracking is the um, process of extraction of shale gas which involves horizontal drilling. Um, the, the environmental damage in terms of the water usage and the other damage which is created to the environment because of shale gas is one of the obstacles in the path of shale gas. This is actually the reason why in India though we have the we have some shale gas resources in parts of the country which are actually water scarce and then that is why we have not been uh, focusing on extracting that shale gas. That is a negative externality. In the case of a positive externality, <coughs> you, this is uh, f uh, from uh, Dennis the Menace and you can see Mr. Wilson, um, uh, his wife tells him that have you noticed that every yard on the street has Christmas decoration except ours. Everywhere you look there are lights, reindeers, Santas, candy cakes. And ours is the only dark spot on a street ablaze with Christmas spirit. And uh, what Mr. Wilson takes this on as a positive externality in the sense that yeah, it's fantastic. They do all the work and we get to enjoy. It's a great arrangement in his, isn't it? So basically, uh, even if you think in terms of uh, in Diwali, if um, people are lighting up their homes and putting uh, candles and uh, 
if you are not making that effort but you are getting the benefit of that effort by seeing, uh, then that becomes a positive externality. In the similar fashion, if some people maintain some very good gardens and they are putting in efforts to do that, uh, people who are in the neighborhood who are not putting in that effort are getting the benefit of it and that's a positive externality. In most of the cases when we are talking of uh, environmental economics, we are usually dealing with negative externalities. So again to repeat after looking at these two cartoons, uh, we again repeat the definition where we are seeing that basically whenever a variable enters the utility of another entity without the entity's permission or compensation. So let us look at an example and this is from Kolstad. Let us say that there are two factories. There is a steel mill which is producing steel and in the neighborhood there is also a laundry. So let us look at what is the here we are looking at steel production and here we are looking at laundry. So based on the capacity of the steel mill and the laundry, we can maximum produce a certain amount in the laundry. So this is the maximum amount and for the steel plant, let us say, so you have this rectangle where if both, if they do not affect each other, then you will get this value L and this is the value S and this is, um, but the fact is the steel in the process of ma making steel, we <coughs> have some emissions and the pollution, the air pollution which is there, that air is uh, coming to the laundry. When we look at the laundry, it is drying the clothes uh, using steam and it is uh, taking the air which is there, it depends on the humidity and the comp composition of the air. Um, the exhaust of the steel plant pollutes the air and because of that pollution, the laundry output decreases. And so this is a negative externality that it could happen in the following forms. It could, it could be a this is like a modest or a weak externality or it could be a strong externality where production is affected. in this fashion. So if you see the as the quantity of steel being used increases, the output of the laundry uh, decreases and so as a result of the steel production, despite the laundry not actually planning for it, the uh, output gets affected and instead of L, we are now only able to produce a certain uh, smaller value as the S. So essentially what happens is in an externality, you can see this, right? Uh, in an externality, we are saying that if we take an entity with a utility function u as a function of x and y, x are all the input parameters that it controls and it plans for, y is a parameter which is coming from outside which the in entity does not have control over. So for instance, if we are, if the laundry has a production function like this, which says L x1, x2, 2 xn and E, where E is the emissions occurring because of the steel factory. So this is an externality, this affects the laundry production and we saw that this uh, the the for the steel plant this is s is z1 z2 and so on zm and then
the value of E which is created E is also a function of Z 1 Z 2 to Z m. So, the externality which is created is a function of uh, the amount which is we are create uh, the value of s and we get a certain emission factor which is coming out. So, now if we look at this, this would mean that if you look at now the effect which is happening, we are seeing that let us say let me start with s and l and then we have something like this. So, if you look at this because of the uh, externality the points that we can now operate we can uh, maximum we can get the output now for the laundry is uh, here and uh, if we look at this we can operate either at this point or at this point where we have a maximum amount of steel production and certain amount of production in the laundry. And in this case what would happen is that uh, if we look at the cost function the total revenue which is the price of steel into production of steel, price of laundry into production of laundry. For this, this is a line with the ratio um, with the slopes related to the prices and if you look at this if uh, S is equal to 0 what we get is Y 0 is P S uh, sorry P L into the value of L 0. So, L 0 is Y 0 by P L and this is this point, this point is Y 0 by P L and we will get curve which goes through this is the revenue function. Uh, it, now, suppose we want to remove this externality, one possible way of doing that is to say that let us say that the same company owns the laundry and the steel mill or the steel mill buys the laundry, in which case this now does not remain an externality, it is a decision that you can change the factor Z 1 to Z m so that the emission changes and because of the emission the laundry changes. So, the laundry output would change. So, what we can now do is we can get a line parallel to this and we get a new point which is S 1 L 1 and obviously, the revenue here is going to be higher than the value that we had. So, this is now y 1 by p l and uh, so essentially what we get is we are maximizing the revenue. Now, this no longer remains an externality, this is internal the emission becomes internal to the company. So, this is one way of removing the externality thinking in terms of maximizing the total output of the laundry and the steel mill and we can compare this and then see how much is the overall loss between these two uh, the laundry and the steel mill. But if they are separate we can then compute that this is the uh, loss in revenue of the laundry caused by the externality and based on this. So, this is a sort of simple example to illustrate the impact of the externality. In many cases <laughs> when we talk about externality, when we look at a marginal cost, we have a private marginal cost 
uh, which is not looking at the impact that it is having or the adverse impact it is having on society. If we add to that the marginal cost of pollution, we can get another curve which shows the uh, social marginal cost. Now, this was we were talking in terms of this in terms of an externality caused by the production function. Let us think in terms of the externality uh, caused due to the utility or the consumption function. So, let us consider an individual and let us look at river an individual um, who has a given a utility function and that utility function has a combination of uh, different goods and uh, then we, what we are looking at is the total amount of if you are looking at the amount of goods which is being uh, other goods which is being purchased we are looking at a, uh, an individual who who is uh, getting some utility from swimming and utility from other goods and then what happens is as if the river if the um, river pollution increases then the uh, utility or the benefit that you get from swimming starts decreasing. So, with the result that to have the same amount of utility you must have other goods to compensate for it. So, you will get a curve like this for this constant utility if you are looking at an indifference curve it goes to this point. It this goes to a point where the river is so polluted that we would not the, there is no utility to be gained through swimming which would mean that the utility function will become a horizontal line. So, this is a particular indifference curve and then you would have another indifference curve which is parallel to this going up to here and then uh, sorry it should come up to here it should basically you will see that it comes up to here and then this. So, that is this is another way of looking at the uh, indifference curves and then this is the consumption externality, consumption externality caused by river pollution and that pollution could be done uh, maybe by the steel mill that we were talking about and uh, so the question is that you know, of course, we can convert this into the um, into uh, an economic term by looking at let us say a holiday resort where it gets a revenue based on swimming and then there is a, a steel mill which is polluting the river and because of that the revenue of the uh, holiday resort can decrease and we can quantify this kind of an impact. So, in a sense we have shown some simple examples. Um, hypothetical examples of production externality and consumption externality. Now, let us look at uh, the uh, if uh, let us look at a simple example and this is from the uh, 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 book by Callan and Thomas and uh, we have two uh, characteristics supply and demand curves. The price this is for a refinery the price is given as 10 plus 0 0.075 q we are just following that example. So, we will use the units this is the supply units given by uh, the example in Callan and Thomas and the demand is P is 42 minus 0.125 q where q is 1000 barrels per day and P is the price in US dollars US dollars per barrel. So, let us look at the supply which we are talking of this is 
also the marginal private cost. So, this can be we can write this as the marginal private cost is going to be 10 plus 0 0.075 q and the marginal private benefit is 42 minus 0.125 q. Now, we can take this and draw. So, we can uh, we can look at drawing this. Uh, suppose, there is also a marginal external cost. Marginal external cost is given as marginal external cost. That means, every for every barrel that is processed in the refinery, there is a certain amount of pollution and that pollution is uh, we assign a cost to it and that is the cost which the refinery has to pay maybe as a tax and an environmental tax to the uh, society and that is given as 0 0.05 q. So, if uh, marginal ex external cost is 0 0.05 q then the marginal social cost social cost this will be the sum of the marginal private cost which is the cost to the refinery plus the marginal external cost that means see now we have put a value to the externality the externality is because the refinery is affecting the utility functions of the society so we can do this and then the marginal social cost will be 10 plus 0 0.075 q plus 0 0.05 q and this comes out to be 10 plus 0 0.125 plus 5.125 q. What about the marginal social benefit? Marginal social benefit this will be equal to marginal social uh, marginal private benefit plus marginal external benefit. So, in case there was a positive externality this is what would have come. Now, here M E B will be equal to 0. So, this marginal social benefit is equal to marginal private benefit which is nothing but 42 minus 0.125 q. Now, let us look at the equilibrium that we get. So, what happens here is if we see we had written this marginal private cost and marginal private benefit and if we do not uh, consider uh, the externality which is the normal situation uh, where we are just looking at the uh, uh, equilibrium between the private cost and benefit and then this is going to be we can equate the two 10 plus 0 0.075 q is 42 minus 0.125 q. So, we get 32 is equal to 0. this comes here once and 0.75. So, you get 0.2 q and q becomes equal to 32 by 0.2. So, that is this is 160 uh, 160 and this is the 1000 barrels per day now let us look at what is the price price is going to be equal to 10 plus 0 0.075 
into 160. So, this is uh, 160 if you see it is uh, 1 2 7.5 1 2 into 1.6 that means so 16 uh, 10 16 into 3 fourths that's 12 12 plus 10 this is 22 US dollars per barrel. So, we got the equilibrium which is uh, going to be 160 and 22. Okay. So, if we draw this sketch this now. you can show this as this way and uh, you will get <coughs> we get this value 160 and 22. Now, what happens is that we can sketch it like this. Uh, we get this as 10 and this is coming from 42 onwards. So, this is 42 and this comes down here and here you have from 10. <coughs> this is the um, uh, price and this is the quantity in 1000, this is the price and we get an equilibrium which is here which is 160, this is 22. Now, what happens is we want to now put the, if you remember we got the marginal social cost and that marginal social cost we had calculated that as uh, the added to that the external cost. So, we got the marginal social cost uh, as 10 plus point uh, 5 uh, q. So, then the slope this slope changes it starts with 10, but it will so as a result of this what happens is because now we are taking an additional cost the optimal equilibrium point now shifts the price increases and the quantity decreases and as a result of this what happens is that uh, we are now reducing the uh, total amount of quantity we are also reducing the uh, pollution which is happening in the society. So, if you see this in this curve you see that this is what happens and we can make that calculation because now what we have is it is 10 plus 0.125 q is equal to 42 minus 0.125 q. So, what we get is 0.25 q is equal to 32 q becomes equal to 128, 128,000. You can substitute that back in the price and you get price now is equal to 26 dollars per barrel. So, now this point which is there is 128 and this is 26. So, with the result now what happens is if in the initial case we had maximized we have the consumer and the producer surplus being maximized. However, we had not taken the externality into it once you shift this there is a social cost which was there which we had not considered. If you look at this now uh, we are measuring if you look at the society's net gain in the refinery market and 
this is again from the Callan and Thomas uh, example. You see that these are the equilibrium points. If you look at these points, you will find that there is a net. <coughs> the society gains this trapezium W, X, Y, Z. W, X, Y, Z is the society's gain. The refineries are losing X, W, Y, Z. This is lost. This is the loss in the overall um, uh, uh, the sur surplus which was there. And because of that, now the net gain which is there is just W, X, Y. So, overall what is happening is that um, we can, uh, the, if you do not consider the so external cost and the social cost, as compared to that, the refinery is losing, uh, the, uh, there is a net uh, loss in the surplus. However, the societal cost, when that is considered, the externality, the, the impact to society, that is decreased now because the pollution is decreased, the quantity is decreased, and that offsets the loss which is incurred by the um, refinery. And because of that, uh, the overall, it, it makes sense to quantify and to cost the externality and to put a price on the social cost. Of course, this is easier said than done, what is the appropriate price and, and this. But you can see that by doing that, uh, the equilibrium shifts. And uh, so, this is one way in which we can deal with the externalities. Uh, you can look at more details in the, uh, the three books uh, by Kolstad, Tietenberg and uh, Callan and Thomas. And now, we would like to look at a related issue when we talk about the uh, externalities, we need to think in terms of property rights. And uh, the property rights and the coerce theorem are uh, related issues and uh, we will just briefly touch upon this. So, property rights, when we talk about property rights, it means that if, if you have some goods and services, uh, you have property rights on that. This is enforceable. So, that means if someone steals your cell phone, you can make a complaint to the police and get it back. And so, stealing essentially is illegal. You have the property right over your goods and the services that you have procured. In, if this is not there, the goods would could not be excludable, could not be used in the market, cannot be rationed using prices. Uh, so, for instance, take another example of a private bad, for instance, garbage. If there are no laws to prevent littering, then garbage would not be considered to be excludable and then there would not be any property rights in terms of the garbage because any garbage can just, you can just throw it wherever you want and then, the, then there is no issue in terms of. However, if there are strict littering laws, then you have to dispose of the garbage. You own the garbage, that disposal, you will have to incur some costs in doing that disposal. So, now the question of property rights are, in the case of environment, these are important. So, who has the right? Is the, if there is a factory, is a steel mill, does the steel mill have the right to pollute and release emissions to the air? Should we have the right to clean air? Should we be entitled to elimination of pollution? Should we be entitled to compensation for pollution damage? Or should polluters have the right to pollute? And this is an interesting question. Um, there are ethical questions. Uh, related to this questions of fairness, questions of justice. But the interesting thing is from an economic viewpoint, Ronald Coase um, provided an interesting argument which is a little counterintuitive and essentially the argument says that from an economic viewpoint it does not matter who has the right. Whether 
the society or the citizens have the right to clean air or the industry has the right to pollute, the final optimum, economic optimum remains the same. And so that is a very interesting uh, and the example Ronald Coase's paper talks about a number of different examples. He talks about the example of farmers rearing cattle and uh, the straying cattle affecting the farmer's crops. And then uh, another example where there is a tall building blocking the air currents of a wind turbine. So, the wind turbine output gets affected by the um, building. So, the question is whether the building has the right to do that or the wind turbine has the right to have a free uh, space and the building should get permission from the wind turbine or should compensate the wind turbine manufacturer. A building casting a shadow on a cabana and a swimming area in the sun bathing area of a hotel and uh, resulting in a loss of the revenue to the hotel. And then, so then there are these uh, uh, airport coming in a particular location and affecting the residents and the noise and then there are many different cases which are there. So, the uh, uh, Ronald Coase discusses and looks at legal judgments in many of these cases. And the question being raised is who should have the rights, the polluter or the victim. For instance, we talked about the steel factory or the laundry and then we said, okay, if we combine them, we get an optimal. But who has the right? Does the steel factory have the right or the laundry have the right? And the laundry has the right to clean air then the steel factory will have to compensate. If the steel factory has the right to pollute because maybe it was there before and then the laundry, uh, the, then it would not give any compensation. A refinery or a car factory, again the refinery affecting the uh, um, um, output and polluting and affecting the car factory, steel factory or a hotel, refinery or recreation, recreational users. And these are all from different textbooks and Ronald Coase's paper talks about a doctor and a confectioner. Um, so, Ronald Coase um, uh, proposed the Coase theorem and got the Nobel Prize in 1991. This paper is uh, was for a, research, a paper that he published in 1960, it is called the problem of social cost. It is in the journal of law and economics and you can look up the original paper. And his uh, theorem, the cost theorem says, in the absence of transaction costs, the allocation of resources is independent of the initial assignment of property rights. Which means that if there are no transaction costs involved, then it is immaterial who has the rights, whether the polluter or the victim has the rights. And uh, we result, we, the, we would get the same economic solution. And uh, so, the proper assignment of property rights, even if externalities are present, will allow bargaining between parties such that an efficient solution will result regardless of who holds the rights. And this assumes costless transactions <coughs> and it assumes that damages are accessible and measurable. So, um, in Coase's own words, he says that what I showed in that article as I thought was that in a regime of zero transaction costs, an assumption of standard economic theory, negotiations between the parties would lead to those arrangements being made which would maximize wealth and this irrespective of the initial assignments of rights. This is the infamous Coase theorem named and formulated by Stigler, although it is based on work of mine. So, it was Ronald Coase who gave this, uh, who did, did this, but it was articulated as the Coase theorem by another famous economics, uh, uh, Joseph Stickler. Uh, so, the example that he, Ronald Coase talked of in his paper is that <coughs> the confectioner, the confectioner is making um, uh, cakes and other uh, uh, confectionery items. And this has two mortars and a pestle and uh, 
had 60 years of operation on a particular street. So it has a confectionery shop which was doing fairly well and it's been there for a long time. And there was also a doctor's clinic at the same time. Um, and there was no difficulty for the initial eight years until the doctor built a new consulting room next to the confectioner's kitchen. And uh, the confectioner, the noise from some of the confectioner's machinery prevented the doctor from examining patients, especially for chest diseases where he, the, uh, the sound being used from the chest which was, which has to be uh, actually assessed by the doctor, the sound of the machinery affects that. And uh, there was a case which was filed and there was legal action to stop the use of machinery. Uh, and uh, so the court ruled in favor of the doctor and got an injunction against the use of machinery. And uh, what court says is whether the doctor won the case or the confectioner won the case, the final result would be the same. And uh, bargaining is possible. The confectioner could assess what is the doctor's loss of income. And because of that, the doctor could move. So, doctor, comp depending on what is the amount of loss of income caused by the doctor or the doctor's inconvenience to move to another location, uh, to can uh, could be the cost which is incurred and if the confectioner's revenue exceeds that, the confectioner could compensate the doctor for this. And, uh, and this would be done even if, if the confectioner, um, the doctor uh, could build a wall or mitigate the noise uh, and uh, this could be done where the, if the confectioner, if the doctor had the rights uh, then and the confectioner is uh, losing out on, uh, the doctor had the rights and the doctor stops the confectioner from uh, uh, continuing its operation, the confectioner's revenue exceeds the losses of the doctor, the confectioner could then pay the doctor to build a wall or to mitigate the noise or to move. And uh, if the confectioner had the rights and the doctor had a loss of uh, income uh, then, uh, and that income was less than the confectioner, the doctor would go ahead and uh, build the wall to mitigate the noise. So the interesting thing, uh, so the thing is that confectioner willing to do this if the payment to doctor is less than the fall of income if you change the mode of operation, abandoned operation or switch the operation. So what if the confectioner had won the case? If that is the confectioner had won the case, then uh, the, it would depend on the, the, the doctor uh, making the, uh, getting the loss of revenue and the doctor would pay the confectioner uh, uh, to continue the operations or uh, make its own. So then basically, if there is no, if this transaction cost is negligible or is zero, then it does not matter who has the rights. And this is, the, this is a very interesting uh, kind of statement. Of course, in practice, you know, we always have transaction costs. And in terms of fairness, in, there is always the issue of compensating uh, the, uh, in the case of an industry, you have to compensate uh, the people who are affected and so externalities. Uh, there, and of course, in all of this, there is an issue of trade-offs and costs and there is an issue in terms of um, the equity and fairness. Um, so with this, we complete the portion on uh, analysis of externalities. And we will move on now and we will talk in terms of financing of uh, energy.